This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights, where we bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. Today, we welcome Kirsten Sweeney, Accessibility and Inclusion Manager at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. They're here to discuss the importance of and growing need for accessibility coordination positions in the workplace, their career path and future steps required to improve inclusion and equity for the disability community in the arts. Kirsten, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great, and before we start, we're going to uh, give our self descriptions. Um, I am a woman in my early 50s, uh, a white woman with brown wavy hair. Um, I have light colored eyes and I have on some um, pink earrings and a pink t-shirt today. Um, Kirsten, would you be able to do the same and give a self description and share with our audience a little bit more about yourself and the work you do? Yeah. Um, so. Hi, I'm Kirsten. Um, I am a white non-binary person with short, uh, dark colored hair. I have uh, red framed glasses on um, and I have on a sort of forest green sweater today. Um, and I work as the accessibility and inclusion manager at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, um, which is a museum on the Upper East Side of New York City, one of the only Smithsonian's in the city. Um, and we are uh, the only museum in the nation that uh, focuses solely on um, historical and contemporary design. Um, so as accessibility and inclusion manager there, I sort of touch every aspect of what the museum does, ensuring that our ex exhibitions are accessible as possible, um, ensuring that we have uh, programs running for disabled visitors to come and, and access all that the museum has to offer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I also uh, currently volunteer as one of the co-chairs of an organization called MAC, the Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium, um, and we are a collective of folks working across arts and culture in New York City, so in museums, theaters, um, other types of performing arts organizations, libraries, gardens, um, all of that. Um, all folks who are interested in accessibility and disability activism, et cetera, um, just sort of a place for folks to come together and learn from each other and share resources. Um, so yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that information. And I, I feel like I want to like pick apart each part of what you said so we can learn more about it. Um, and if we can, let's start off about talking uh, talking about your career path uh, towards becoming an accessibility coordinator, like first, what what attracted to you this to, uh, attracted you to this type of position, and also how this type of position actually came into being, right? Because um, not every industry or employer has this position. So, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so, starting with sort of my own path. Um, I, you know, from a very young age was always in love with the arts. I uh, started doing theater at a very young age and, and I knew that was something that, you know, I sort of wanted to be a part of my life forever. Um, I also, you know, from a very young age sort of knew that there was something different about me, but didn't at the time have language to really identify or describe what that was. Um, until as an adult, I received an autism diagnosis. Um, so as I was going into college um, and, you know, wanting to sort of work in the theater industry and then after college entering the arts workforce um, with this sort of new disability identity, um, my main priority was, you know, ensuring that people like me who felt sort of marginalized or excluded um, or like art spaces maybe weren't built for them um were able to engage with arts and culture um which is really something that i believe at least is you know a, a fundamental human right to be able to participate in culture um as fully as you know anybody else um so my first sort of accessibility focused role was at an organization called the alliance of resident theaters new york 
um, which is an organization that provides a whole suite of amazing services to nonprofit theaters across New York City. Um, and so through my role there, I was able to educate um, folks who were members of, of Art New York um, about what it meant to create accessible and inclusive theater environments um, and got to connect with a lot of disabled artists and people across the field. And then it was through that that I got involved with MAC, got connected to folks doing this work in museum spaces and found my way to, to Cooper Hewitt. Um, Anderson, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to... Yeah. Um... I want to stop and ask you something about what you just said, where you said not all spaces are necessarily built for accessibility or for people who may have disabilities coming into them. Can you just expand a little bit on that? I, I feel like when we're talking about accessibility and we're talking about accommodations, there's often this um, the the way that the conversations are going are about how can um, we make this space um, accessible for this person, as opposed to things maybe being built access uh, in an accessible way to begin with. So, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, looking sort of historically, disabled people were not considered really in any way in in the physical design of of our buildings um, or in the sort of creation of the the social spaces or the interpersonal spaces that that we were in, you know, historically disabled folks have been, you know, very much excluded from society. And I'm sure that, that that's things that you, you know, other folks have talked about on your podcast as well. Um, but I think, you know, especially um, being in New York City, just thinking about the buildings and the streets that are here, they are not built um, for the most part with accessibility in mind. And then the ADA came around and, you know, folks started to have to make changes and, you know, newer buildings, you know, maybe are a little bit more um, sort of up to code, at least in terms of base level compliance. But um, I don't know that um, beyond compliance, there is in a lot of spaces, a real sense of uh, like an inclusive culture and a real understanding that people with experiences different from your own will be in the space that you're in. Um, and so when non-disabled folks are uh, almost always, you know, the ones in power, the ones making decisions about how spaces, both physical and sort of social are, are shaped. Um, and, you know, just sort of by nature of their own lived experience, they aren't necessarily thinking about um, uh, disabled people's experiences. Um, so yeah, and I think that's also something. This question of of sort of uh, changing existing spaces to make them accessible is one I've been thinking about a lot because I think that's great and really important. And also, what I've started to become really interested in is sort of exactly what you were saying, which is just generating spaces that are by default for um, disabled people. So that's what I'm really interested in and where I sort of see the field going as more people are starting to become aware of these kinds of conversations. I think that's such a um, an important path and direction for the conversation to go in. And I think that will really tie in nicely for you to talk to us a little bit more about how you got to Cooper Hewitt, but also the role of an accessibility coordinator in and of itself and why it's so important. Um, because as I said initially, not necessarily ever every organization or every employer has one. And um, and as you said earlier, you know, people who are either making decisions or in power, if people who have uh, who are um, in the space that need an accommodation, and I would even, you know, I would even pull back from saying, you know, a certain number of people, if we are building for accessibility, then it is accessible for everyone, as opposed to building for um, a, a, an exclusive part of a community now, and then accommodations are, are necessary. So to your point, if we aren't, if we don't have these accessibility coordinators in every industry or employer, how are those conversations going to be fully 
uh, recognized? How are they going to be fully seen? So if you can, you know, talk about your experience and and the importance of having an accessibility coordinator so that everyone really can have access. Yeah, um, I think this is like a really complex question. And I, so on a base level, yes, I think having, you know, at least one accessibility person on your staff, hopefully more, um, you know, someone whose role is 100% dedicated to accessibility, not accessibility and something else, which is also something that tends to happen to a lot of folks at arts organizations in particular, where accessibility is sort of tacked on to everything else they already have to do. But when someone is truly dedicated to only doing that, and when your organization or your company is you know, dedicating a salary amount of your budget to accessibility like that, I think just from the baseline speaks to what you, you are valuing and prioritizing as, as an organization, because a budget at the end of the day is a reflection of your values as an organization. And so I think just putting the money to it in the sense of we're going to hire somebody to do this, I think signal something to everybody else, both within your organization and outside, that this is something that we have a deeper commitment to. Um, and then, of course, there is then somebody on the staff um, who can sort of um, maintain like a bigger picture view of what's going on and sort of dream big about larger scale accessibility projects. I find when there aren't accessibility staff you know, at an organization, there might be a couple of staff who are just sort of individually passionate about, um, you know, making things accessible. Maybe they're, you know, writing some alt text for images or things like that. But it's hard to sort of create lasting systemic change that way when it's just sort of little pockets of people. Um, and I, I will just add sort of a caveat, um, which is that I do find accessibility coordinator positions sometimes to be a little bit of a double-edged double -edged sword um, in the sense that when somebody is hired into that position, it can give everybody else at the organization permission to sort of step back and be like, that's not my job when it comes to accessibility. And so I think hiring that person while also ensuring that there's buy-in across the entire organization, that accessibility is everybody's responsibility and it's part of what we all do. I think when those two things can be married, there's like real potential for great things to happen. I agree with you. And, you know, you talked a little bit about budget. You've talked a little bit about systemic change. And, um, and both of those things are are impacted by budget, right? I mean, if someone doesn't have the ability to hi hire a dedicated person to really be looking at accessibility and being an accessibility coordinator, as you said, really making sure that accessibility is an organization-wide or um, industry-wide um, thought process thinks, you know, for me, it it brings me to the place of the DIE um, space, right? And how there are a lot of organizations and employers who are bringing in consultants or ensuring that they have um, some form of uh, DIE coordination within their entire uh, community. And oftentimes uh, disability is left out of that. And so one of the things that I've, I've been interested in and, and really wanted to ask you about, considering this is your role, right? Like as an accessibility coordinator, this is your role. How is it that we can encourage employers to really start including disability in these conversations. So it is, it still is part of the thought process. It's the overall um, feeling and, um, and importance for the entire organization. What are some steps that employers can take um, on a, on a small level, if they're, you know, a small company of, you know, five or 10 people, um, and even larger organizations, how can our organizations really be thoughtful about disability, especially when it comes to the inclusion conversation? Um, if they feel like they don't have the budget to do it, how are some ways that that we can look at doing that on a on a granular level that will have systemic change? Yeah, um, that 
you know, that's the million dollar question <laughs> for sure. I think, you know, everybody wants that perfect zero dollar solution to you right. know, making making things, you know, 100 percent inclusive. Um, and I, I think, you know, the place to start is it, within and, and like really working from the inside out and starting with um, conversation and getting starting to build that buy-in and just that sort of level of understanding and just comfortability amongst, you know, your staff and the folks at your organization about even talking about disability, about understanding what it is, about understanding how prevalent it is. Uh, I guarantee you have disabled folks working at your organization, you know, whether or not they feel comfortable disclosing that, I think speaks to, you know, potentially the level of you know, inclusivity internally at your organization. Not that anybody ever has to disclose disability, but um, I think that as folks start talking to each other and learning more and really understanding that disabled people are not just like this, you know, minority, minority that who you never see and who never walks through your doors. If, if disabled folks, if you're not seeing disabled folks walk through your doors, it's because you're not accessible. Um, so I think it building some of that buy-in organically is a great way to then make just sort of start to shift the values of your organization from the inside. And eventually, as those values shift, um, where you prioritize putting your money and spending your time, you know, applying for grants and things like that might shift as well. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I find that in my work, one of the biggest barriers um, and, I, you know, other folks who do accessibility work probably tell you the same thing is a uh, lack of buy-in. Um, so I think as opposed to, I mean, you know, starting with some of the small stuff, like getting alt text written for your images that you post on social media and, you know, making sure you have accessibility information listed on your website, all of that is great and you should do it. But to really you know, have a holistic pro approach to inclusivity and to, you know, starting to foster like a disability affirming culture that has to start in from the inside and people at your organization have to understand why they're doing these things. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. No, I think uh, that's a great answer. And of course, I'm so glad you're here to give us the answer to the million dollar question. <laughs> Um, and as we know, it's it's not that like it's not that simple that there's just one answer, right? We're talking yeah. about people and we're talking about organizations and really how you create a culture of buy-in is is going to be also specific to the organization itself. Um and as you were talking, I was thinking about the the reality of um, how a lot of people who maybe aren't necessarily familiar with the disability community, when they think about accommodation, they're thinking, oh, wait, we need to put a ramp outside or something like that's their the go to idea where when we talk about accessibility, especially now um, with technology really running the show, right? Like technology is moving at such a, a high pace and um, we're all trying to keep up with what's what's happening next. Um, but if if we aren't having alt text in images and we're not making sure that uh, our our PDFs are readable or um, how accessibility is, it's a such a large and vast industry that it is, it's not a simple, okay, check the box here. It's how are we really making sure that every person has access to spaces, information, um, the ability to to even Zoom, um, you know, when I, sh I say Zoom, but the platforms that are out there to have virtual meetings, um, we saw that in the shutdown, right? When when the pandemic happened, we there were several other platforms that were um, being used, and I'm sure they there still are, but there was definitely uh, a lot of platforms that didn't have accessibility features 
built in. And now we see them really racing to whether it's um, closed captioning AI that is becoming incredibly accurate, um, ensuring that uh, there's a way to change contrast on your on your um, monitors or on your visuals of these. So, so as we think about accommodation and we think about accessibility, this is a very large body of work. It's a big subject area and um, and it requires education. So I, I really do appreciate you giving your experience in this as well as uh, the bottom line is people need to start really paying attention to and getting educated on how vast of a subject area this is. Um, and so you have a very unique position in what you're doing with accessibility um, because art in and of itself is presented through a multitude of mediums and accommodations we're just talking about have to be diverse and they have to adapt um, and you don't want them to conflict with the artist's vision. So this is a really tall order for you. And I would love to hear you talk about that process and um, how you're really incorporating um, accommodations, uh, as well as uh, really thinking about the artist's vision. Talk to me about how that um, how that works and what your process is like, and how the success of that really has you know changed the way things are are being presented. Yeah, um, it's definitely yeah a really tough a tough question, and I think you know everybody who does accessibility work um, that you know also interacts with artists in any way. It's it's always a constant conversation. Um, and I think for me, it, it really all goes back to buy-in, first of all. Like I just can't sort of come blazing out the gate to all of these, you know, artists and curators that we have to do this, 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 this thing, because then that makes accessibility feel like a burden. It feels like constraint. It feels like, oh, this is something we have to do. Like um, it is not setting us up for success because then I also, then, you know, I'm going to spend more <laughs> meetings arguing with people about why we have to do, you know, simple things. But if I try as much as I can to present accessibility to people as, um, as, as something exciting, something that fosters creativity and like it uh, will allow us to think about um, the way we're presenting work in new and exciting ways. I think especially, you know, Cooper Hewitt being a design museum, I think we're in a really unique position because it, accessible design is good design. And, you know, like, let's think about really exciting and cool ways that we can showcase um, some innovative design that is also, you know, sort of radically inclusive and and really welcomes people into an experience regardless of how they are accessing that experience um and you know that's sort of the blue blue sky like you know ideal way that it will go in reality it's you know not always that perfect that people are just like yeah let's go you know we're working on often quite a tight timeline when we're putting up exhibitions and you know artists rightfully so do have a very specific vision about their work and I am not one to you know, tell somebody they have to fundamentally change their piece just to, to sort of, um, you know, make it accessible. So I, I try to understand, you know, what the artist's vision is, and then talk through a variety of solutions. Um, you know, if we have an artist who has a lot of video pieces that are going to be in an exhibition, you know, our sort of guidelines are every video has to have captions and audio description. Um, but, you know, the way that we deliver that can can change so that we make sure that we are still upholding the artist's vision. You know, can we, instead of just having, you know, the sort of black bar of white captions at the bottom of the screen that, you know, maybe an artist might see as ugly or intrusive to their work, can we design captions that sort of integrate artistically into the piece? Um, do I've I involved artists in drafting audio descriptions so that some of that um, language comes from them and they can be describing their own work? Um, and then, you know, I, that ultimately 
now that artist has a greater understanding of accessibility, that they can move forward into their work and their career sort of beyond just working with us. Um, and so, yeah, I do, I do, you know, realize that I have a lot of responsibility in sort of helping people understand why this is important and how they can apply it to what they do. But um, when it sort of clicks and we can come up with something really exciting, um, that's, you know, the best feeling. I can imagine that it is. I, I am thinking that really um, you're creating separate pieces of art as well, right? So if there's, a, especially when you're talking about, you know, closed captioning, and if there's a way that you can create something that um, maybe goes with the the piece itself that is new or creative, I mean, that's, you're furthering the way that art is also created. So I think that's just extraordinary. And um, and I would love to hear maybe some from the artists too, to see how, how they felt about the process. Um, and I want to come back to, you know, the beginning, we talked a little bit about your path. We talked a little bit about um, how you got to be um, the accessibility coordinator. And you started to talk about MAC. Um, and if I get this right, it's the Museum um, of Arts and Culture. Um, is that the acronym? It's the Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium. Really, it should be MACAC, but... <laughs> It started just as the Museum Access Consortium. And then when the group expanded to include like all of the arts and culture field, um, they kept the acronym. So, okay. Well, thank yeah. you for the correction on that because I, I wrote it down. I'm like, that can't be, I know that's not everything that she said it was. So, um, all good. And so, if you could please um, talk about your work at MAC and share with us about its mission and how really this mission has been part of your experience? Yeah, so um, Mac's mission is really to, you know, foster a more accessible, inclusive, disability-affirming um, arts and culture space in New York City. Um, the organization started 30 years ago, 30 years ago just as a, a small group of museum access workers who came together to, you know, meet monthly and, and share resources, talk about their experiences, just sort of be a community together because often this work can get very lonely. You know, I am the sole accessibility person working at Cooper Hewitt. Some museums, larger museums might have larger staff, some don't. Um, and so it's really nice to be able to share um, with other folks, your, you know, other peers doing this work. Um, and then over time, you know, the group has grown in scope significantly. Of course, now, you know, we're not just museum focused, it's arts and, arts and culture more broadly. Um, we still, you know, try to maintain that sort of spirit of connecting accessibility professionals to each other and being a space where folks can share resources and ideas and, and just sort of commiserate about the, the kind of work that we do. Um, but we also, um, you know, try to do a lot to support um, disabled folks specifically working in the field, um, disabled artists, and especially folks who are trying to enter the field be and enter the, the arts and culture workforce. Um, because I, I think that, you know, it's, it's really important for disabled folks to be making these, these changes to the arts and culture field and to have the power. Um, to, you know, to lead the sort of new direction that the field will be going in. And so um, we have a program at MAC called Supporting Transitions um, that uh, specifically supports um, adults who are autistic or have other intellectual developmental disabilities um, to, to enter the arts and culture workforce. Um, and the reason um, to really focus on, on sort of this community specifically um, is because of um, the the sort of what's called the services cliff that a lot of these folks face when they leave school. Um, so um, a lot of folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, receive a lot of services while they're in school, might also be in the school system a little longer than, um, you know, their non-disabled peers. And then once they graduate, all of the services 
they receive just stop. Um, and that's this services cliff that we're talking about. And so supporting transitions really sprang into being as a way to support that transition, to sort of build a bridge across that cliff so that folks can leave school and have a pathway to entering the workforce if that's something that they're interested in doing. Um, so we have uh, uh, an, inter an internship program um, that uh, pairs um, you know, interns with arts and culture organizations. Those interns receive a one-on-one -on -one job coach and, and training and things like that. And then the organizations also receive training on how to um, you know, foster an inclusive workplace and how to, yeah, just be more accessible and welcoming because we're not trying to, you know, place folks into an environment where they can't succeed. Um, we uh, also have a program called the Self Advocate Corps, um, Corps, C O R P S. Um, so, a group of folks who have been trained um, to essentially be professional self-advocates, so to become consultants and to be paid to speak about their experience and, and help other organizations, you know, improve their accessibility work. Um, and yeah, lots of other, lots of other little things. I don't have to give whole, whole spiel, but um, yeah, just doing what we can to make sure that the sort of new generation um, coming into the workforce um, is is equipped with with the skills to succeed, and we will put the contact information in the notes of the podcast yeah. so people can reach out and connect. Um, what a great organization! Um, and and I want to just finish off. I know um, I want to hear if there's anything else that is going on um, at Cooper Hewitt that you want to talk to us about. But we talked a little bit about technology. We talked a little bit about the shutdown, and we talked about education mostly, right? And how really helping the general population um, become more aware of the disability community. Have you seen, say, you know, if if we say here, you know, in 2023, we've been maybe out of the shutdown, post shutdown for maybe 18 months. It's hard for me to even say because there was such a, um, a, a wobbly line really about what, what the shutdown meant for, for a lot of people. Um, but say we're, we're post shutdown for even a year. We could say it was even a year. What in your experience, um, have you seen any awareness that has improved since then, or has it been very obvious that there are areas that still require education. Um, and just from your experience, it's something that I find very interesting as we saw an entire globe um, become very aware of accessibility and being able to work from home, as well as being exposed to uh, sign language on a regular basis. So um, just from your experience, have you seen any um, areas that have improved or some that really still need a lot of education. Yeah, I mean, there have there's definitely been improvement. I think, like you said, people are just generally more aware that you know disabled people exist and um, you know what accessibility is. Um, you know, I think the need for things like captions and ASL interpretation, like you said. Um, alt text on images, the kinds of things that are very sort of visible and, and straightforward, people sort of know um, that those exist. Um, I, beyond the sort of surface level, I think a lot still needs to be done. Um, I don't know that a, a lot of people are really in the place uh, to think about what you know, an inclusive world would truly look like in the sense of doing anything that actually disrupts sort of the status quo that they're used to. And we've seen this, you know, over the past few years with the public's response to COVID, you know, everybody, you know, was all, or not everybody, but <laughs> a lot of people were, you know, ready to wear masks, ready to meet virtually, work from home, et cetera, for, you know, a year or so. Um, and 
you know, coming out of that, it's like, oh, we could have learned a lot of great public health practices that, you know, made our entire world more accessible for folks who, you know, are, you know, compromised, who, you know, maybe are housebound, who can't, you know, who for decades and centuries prior had been access asking for these kinds of things and weren't receiving them and how quickly all of that disappeared when non-disabled people got tired of it. Um, and yeah, so I don't know that people are yet sort of ready to be uncomfortable and to like make some of the more meaningful changes that are actually needed to build like a truly diverse and inclusive society. But, you know, it change is slow and the needle has, you know, shifted a millimeter to one side or the other. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's true for all sort of um, anti-oppression movements that like the folks who are in the positions of privilege and positions of power, and I don't just mean like leaders of organization, I mean position of power in the sense that, you know, being non-disabled is a position of power in, um, in itself. And like folks need to, I think, get a little bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable and with understanding what it means to accommodate others and to not just have every space uh, accommodate 100% your needs, but to really be thinking about other people's needs as well. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for you. That's a really well thought out response. I really appreciate being able to look at it from that perspective. There is, there's so much that we can, um, that we can look back on and observe as, um, you know, if, if everyone maybe had the awareness that they had at that initial moment and carried that through, maybe we would see a little bit more of uh, long-term change. Um, and so uh, before we do sign off, is there anything that's happening at Cooper Hewitt that you want to let us know about or at uh, MACAC? <laughs> and I'll just say that now um, <laughs> that you want to let our audience know about and we can put uh, links in our notes to any events coming up. Um, is there anything you want to talk to us about today? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll start with Mac, actually, because we just spent the past couple of years um, sort of throughout, you know, the pandemic really undergoing a deep strategic planning process and rethinking who we are as an organization um, to hopefully start to become um, a more equitable, sustainable organization, and most importantly, to stop <laughs> relying solely on volunteers to run our organization. Um, and so we've just sort of newly announced ourselves as as the, the new and, and still becoming MAC, um, but we are um, looking for more folks to join our community, to get involved, whether, you know, just as a member to sort of access our services or to join um, a committee um, and have a little bit more involvement in, in our programs and our advocacy and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll share a link that has some more information about ways you can get involved. But if you are somebody um, who has a connection to New York City and is um, passionate about um, disability in the arts and culture space, I think Mac is a really great place for you. Um, and yeah, Cooper Hewitt, um, we have uh, a couple of great um, accessible exhibitions up at the moment. Um, one is called Give Me a Sign, The Language of Symbols. Um, it's open through September 2024. Um, and uh, lots of great um, tactile elements built into that exhibition. We have a descriptive audio tour, um, and it'll take you through how 2D symbols have been designed. Um, our other exhibition that's open right now, A Dark, A Light, A Bright, The Designs of Dorothy Liebes, um, open through February 2024 explores the the life of uh, textile designer Dorothy Liebes. Um, we have a couple of verbal description tours coming up uh, for that show. Um, you'll have the opportunity to feel some fabrics in the style of Dorothy Liebes. I, I will share the information with you, Katrin, so the dates and links and all of that can be in the description. Um, 
And then on November 18th, we have a brand new exhibition opening, um, the Atlas of S. Devlin, um, which explores the work of sort of legendary stage and spectacle designer S. Devlin um, and is a really cool immersive experience. Um, yeah, that's that's what we've got going on. So cool. I hope to get down to see all three of them. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for sharing all the information as well as just your experience. I really um, can't thank you enough for coming on. And um, thank you so much for this conversation. I look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was great. Empire State of Rights has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York, your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. The video for this episode is available on our YouTube channel with closed captioning and ASL interpretation. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. For more Empire State of Rights, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube.